Hey guys, what's up? We need to talk about Hannah Gracie. So not too long ago with the whole court case of uh, Jack Reno, the man who got his neck broken in a jiu-jitsu class, there has been quite a bit of talk around Hannah Gracie and his involvement. In a previous video we did discuss a few things about Hannah's involvement, but I guess we can just talk about him in a bit more depth concerning the fact that he's more of a businessman than an actual uh, caring jiu-jitsu coach. Now, the reason why I say this is because he was brought onto the, or he accepted uh, to be an expert witness on the case, and he was charging $3,000 per hour. And the time that he worked, he got over $100,000. Now, for many niche um, uh, fields of expertise, I mean, they would charge about a third or half that, that rate. But now, even being brought onto the case as an expert witness, and of course, um, combining his breakdown with this, um, he is just, one, either dishonest, or he's not that much of an expert. Now, if we look at the technique in question that was used uh, on that horrific day, uh, he said it was a legal technique. It's not illegal. I see it in competitions all the time. Even the kids' divisions can use it. But also, in his breakdown, he didn't go over all the possible um, scenarios or possibilities that could have resulted in that injury. Just putting all the blame on the instructor. But now, the more experienced you are in grappling or jiu-jitsu, you should be, or you are, more likely to be the safer person. This whole thing was a freak accident. But going back to Hannah Gracie, um, he mentioned a few things about having uh, a written syllabus and, of course, failure to have uh, beginner classes uh, just for beginners, white belts. Now, if you've watched uh, Ramsey Dewey's take on this whole um, thing about Hannah Gracie not being the, the industry standard, well, that can that's definitely correct. Now... When it comes down to, say, having a written syllabus, if you go and attend boxing classes to learn boxing, there's not going to be a written syllabus. Or if you go to any jiu-jitsu club for that matter, there's not going to be a written syllabus. Or judo club, or wrestling club, there's not going to be a written syllabus. Now, the thing is, now especially with jiu-jitsu, right, the sport of jiu-jitsu is changing the whole time and better ways to do techniques are being implemented the whole time. Jiu-jitsu, as we know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is still in its infancy stage. So there's still a lot of changes going to happen. How do you have a written syllabus and keep up to date with what's going on in the world of jiu-jitsu? Now, the other thing is, okay... And this is important. Keeping your classes entertained. I mean, there's a lot of jujitsu content out there now. And students are going to ask questions on how to do these things. And, you know, sometimes doing a bit of a request to be a bit playful in the classes, it's necessary. But on the other hand, when, when you do have an idea or a certain structure of how to teach jujitsu, you're following through with fundamentals. Right, and sometimes depending on the, the atmosphere of the class on a specific day, you might have to change up things. Now, I say that because you could have 10 newbies pop up in your class uh, that day, but it's a possibility, and this could actually change the whole structure of your class, and that's an uh, important thing to consider, especially depending on how you approach your classes. But then, also, that whole idea of a beginner's class, I don't agree with it personally. Because one, I mean, it's important to practice your fundamentals. Those you need to be so good at. Or those you can't stop learning and just practicing again and again and again. Right? So a fundamentals class should be beginner-friendly and 
the senior students should also participate in that just to get a reminder of certain fundamentals. Because once again, there's so much jujitsu out there, it's very easy to have something fall by the waistline. And then the other end of it is these fundamentals, or for these beginner classes, right? Uh, oh yeah, no, you can't teach advanced techniques. But then, you know, you can't teach techniques that's not going to work at a black belt level. Because then the technique's pointless and it's a waste of time. I mean, an upa escape or a trap and roll only works on beginners. Blue belt level, you're going to hit that significantly less, unless they are really incompetent. Or they're not in the class. You know, up here. So, with that being said, it's just like, you've got to mix and match the beginners with the advanced people. I mean, isn't that what jujitsu camps are based on? You know, you have a mix of everyone there. So, that idea of having a separate class for white belts is silly. You need to have classes where you can mix the senior students with the absolute beginners because then, one, the more senior students can look after the beginners and then of course the beginners actually learn something a bit more useful, not something to get an idea on how jujitsu works and then throw it away. The upa escape, it's one of those techniques where you learn the beginning and scrap away because they, you find more effective ways for, to escape from underneath mount, first of all, and two, like it doesn't work against higher level opponents. So, you know, the only reason that you could use it or teach it to beginners is just kind of to kind of teach it like as a jab in order to set up other techniques. But that new student needs to actually go use it and see for themselves. But now with the with the, the safety issue, if you take a a black belt against a white belt, who's going to get more injured in that role? The black belt, because the white belt's going to do spazzy things and do panic reactions, and that's going to lead to small small injuries. All right, the black belt is more experienced in knowing how to control their body and their opponent's body, or their training partner's body. They have acquired the skill in order to do that and to do a lot of maneuvers safely. This doesn't mean that accidents won't happen. But to have white belts, only pair up with white belts, you're asking for trouble. You're going to have many more injuries occur in that because you're going to have a lot of beginners who have this mindset of fighting for their life. They don't know how to relax yet under pressure, utilizing new techniques with a skill that they're not familiar with. And they're going to overcompensate with things like strength, speed, explosiveness, and do movements that they don't really have full control over yet. And of course, that's what's going to lead to more injuries. We had a new white belt sign up and he decided to pull guard, but instead of grabbing my wrist, he decided to have two hands grab uh, two of my fingers. Each hand grabbed two fingers and he was pulling like that. And now I've got even worse fingers than before. But this is just an example. It is a bit minor and they've healed up quite nicely now. But you, you get my point. They do what they want because they don't know any better. And they don't consider the fact of what will actually injure the other person. So what, what, what Hannah Gracie has said in that court case and what he identified as industry standard is completely inaccurate and... Um, not viable and we can't expect anything more from a guy uh, who started Gracie University with his brother where originally you could get your black belt online and then it moved down belts until eventually blue belt now tell me if Helio Gracie's definition of a blue belt was um, for a smaller trained person to be able to beat a bigger untrained person in the fight. How are you going to achieve that goal online? 
It doesn't make sense. You have two people practicing in their garage, going through the videos and the techniques, and maybe they roll. So if you have these online students um, sparring outside of the prescribed coursework, they're going to get themselves hurt because they're inexperienced. The thing is, they'll spar with each other, they will go with all their might, they don't know at what intensity they're supposed to be training at or sparring at, and they don't have a coach there live to guide them through this. And then of course, they also just get used to rolling with each other and not with uh, different um, students or different BJJ athletes. Those of different frames, different mu muscle fiber dominance, different heights, different strengths, uh, different speeds, different experience levels. So, you know, they don't really get a feel for it and what techniques will work with for them in certain situations. So, Henner's idea or industry standard of safety doesn't really make sense. Especially now if you have that garage type thing and you put it in a club where there is a coach there to guide them. Now that also comes to teaching such classes, you know. As an instructor, they can only give so much personal attention to a, a pair at a time. So going towards a pair that are complete beginners, um, as much att attention as possible, because maybe they're not as athletic, um, other pairs that are beginners paired up with senior students um, should be fine. But you see, it's these type of ideas, right, that show uh, Henner, Gracie, Henner Gracie's incompetency. Because it passes him off as a shrewd businessman. There's Gracie University, uh, his idea of industry standard, all right, and that idea of industry standard is trying to accommodate as many people into jujitsu. And let's face it, jujitsu is not for everybody. Combat sport is not for everybody. Wrestling is not for everybody. So why would you try and make a thing that's not for everybody for everybody? Again, with that shrewd businessman thing, you know, charging three thousand dollars per hour, where. Um, other niche expertise would charge a third of that, for instance, or half of that. And then only when he gets heat, he donates 100000 which is just under what he's earned. Um, I don't know what the, the tax amount was from the total amount, but he donated $100,000 to spinal cord injury research, which is pretty cool. But the thing is, he only did that after getting heat for this whole um, incident and his role playing part in it. So, you know, if we look at previous public figures and so social media influences, they do this whole thing when they get a little bit of heat or they are facing a bit of controversy, bam, throw some money down at charity and then they're forgiven. And I mean, if you look at the Paul brothers, for instance, uh, they do this thing the whole time. You know, they get caught with something then they make a public apology, they throw money down somewhere, right? And they continue to have these careers, but they are screwing with their target market or their audience. And that's what I'm accusing Hannah Gracie of. Um, he is screwing with this target market and audience. Because one, um, he doesn't seem completely honest, especially with that breakdown. And his idea of an industry standard just seems like something that is easier for him to sell. But once again, that industry standard that he speaks of doesn't make sense if you are experienced with jujitsu. So just a like a bit of a conclusion or take away of this whole discussion is that we must stop putting all these black belts on a pedestal because that does not mean they are good people or they are brilliant smart minded people they are also humans and they also have their opinions which can be severely flawed but 
from my personal opinion, looking at a lot of Hannah Gracie's uh, content in the past, um, whatever that man, whatever comes out of that man's mouth, I refuse to to listen to because uh, he's just trying to sell something and that sell into something is to get you involved into his cult. But anyway, what do you guys think about this topic? Please let me know in the comment section down below. Until next time, take care.